right, so welcome to Prayer Beyond today, um, Christ Church Ridley Park. We've been talking about how prayer, um, sometimes for some people, they don't have a sense of what prayer would mean beyond just reading words, beyond just a deep, you know, and even just how do you read the words and go beyond just decoding, but how do you enter into intentionality with prayer? And our first guest, who's a friend of Ben's, uh, Sister BJ talked about prayer being like a toy box and all sorts of different toys. And we've been looking at several different toys. So we looked at movement as a toy. And then we looked at the daily office as a diff it's probably the wordiest of the toys. And then so my friend Ben has come over and he's going to talk to us about the exam. The, and I'll let him tell you all about that. But for me, the exam is something I use almost every day and mm. is a way of um, framing the prayers of a few of my prayers beyond dear Jesus, I just want blank. So mm. it gives a format to it that connects with my entire day. So um, my first question for Ben is to, for him to tell us a little bit about his, you know, expertise besides this plastic thing we put on yeah thank you thanks for having me i'm excited to be here to talk about prayer it's one of my favorite things to talk about and believe it or not as a parish priest i feel like i don't get to talk about it as much as you would expect um but it is an important part of my life and spiritual journey which you again seems like you might go without saying but it doesn't always uh so I want to talk a little bit about my prayer background, and um, as you said, let me be an expert on it. I'm glad you had Sister BJ, um, because then if you were here for that, if you heard her talk, then you already know a little bit about some of the context for who I am. I'm wearing black today. I wanted to wear my habit so I could kind of be here in the spirit of my other part of my vocation, um, which is as a a brother in a religious order, I'm a member of the Anamkara Fellowship, a professed member of the Anamkara Fellowship, which is a, um, a religious order, a dispersed religious order in the Episcopal Church. We sometimes call it a new, mis new monastic um, fellowship. Um, and uh, it is with a Celtic spirit. I, I don't want to spend too much time unpacking what that means, but it is essentially a new reflection, a new spirit of monasticism for the 21st century. And, but it's very much in line with the great spiritual leaders of Christian history, especially people like Ignatius of Loyola. I, I really was thinking as I was preparing for today about how indebted uh, orders like mine, like the Anamkar Fellowship are to someone like St. Ignatius, who when I talk about him in a few minutes, uh, he really pioneered, among others, pioneered being able to be both a, a religious order with a, with a monastic spirit, but also dispersed and active in the world in a vocation that is sort of out of a cloister, or out of a monastery, and with people. And so, I, so even though I'm not Jesuit, uh, so I'm not in Ignatius's own tradition, at all, uh, I feel very indebted to him, and that Ignatius and others like him are sort of godfathers or godparents to uh, to traditional orders like mine. The Anamkar Fellowship, we live um, we live and work in our lives away from each other throughout almost all of the time. Uh, there, we have members all over the world, uh, mostly in the United States, and we gather in religious community once a year for something we call our annual gathering, uh, w which. I'm sad to say we decided very recently that we will be doing it remotely again this year via Zoom because of the pandemic. But usually we live together in a monastic environment for a week every year. Um, so that's a little bit of our prayer life in the in the Anamkar Fellowship is kind of unique uh, for in a, in a sense as compared to other religious orders in the Episcopal Church. We pray something called the Celtic Daily Prayer Book, which is would be too long to be worth explaining to you, but kind of has a Baptist origin with a Celtic spirit. And that's kind of what we do for our daily office. Uh, but, you know, my, um, you want me to just go right into sort of my prayer background? Well, I, I was going to ask yeah, you, so ahead. tell me a little bit yeah. about your prayer history. Yeah. Like I've said to the folks in this class that I was not the most prayerful or spiritual child. Um, and so 
I, I'm always curious, actually, if particularly for those of us in this line of work, if you want to say, of what to tell us a little yeah. bit about your prayer history. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in a completely different religious environment than this one. I grew up a Protestant evangelical in a fundamentalist background, in a tradition uh, known as Plymouth Brethren. In that tradition, uh, we had our worship was sort of Quaker esque. Uh, we sat in silence as though someone felt called to stand up and lead a prayer or read a piece of scripture or offer a hymn in our Sunday worship. Only men were allowed to do this. Women were required to wear head coverings and weren't allowed to lead. And so it was a very different kind of environment than the one that I'm in now. And so all prayer in that environment was extemporaneous, but it was also pervasive. We prayed constantly and we were very religious. Church was a part of every aspect of our lives, my family and growing up. And so prayer was very important to my life from my earliest memories. I remember praying with my mom as some of my earliest memories. I remember praying the, as you may know it, the sinner's prayer for salvation as like a five-year-old kid with my mom. I remember going to prayer services where, you know, Wednesday nights where we would just pray for people in need. I remember learning how to pray by listening to other people pray publicly and then taking baby steps and trying to do that myself uh, as like an adolescent. So prayer was kind of one thing, which was extemporaneous. We had no real rich prayer tradition. So when I eventually left that background and I became interested in older forms of Christianity and learning Christian history, I got to learn that there was this entire legacy of prayer traditions, stuff like Jesuits, but also Augustinian prayer traditions and, and monastic prayer traditions um, and uh, Anglican prayer traditions. And man, it was sort of <laughs> overwhelming because it was like a lot to learn. Um, but, you know, just to fast forward a little bit, like I fell in love with learning how to pray different ways. Uh, and, and one of the things I miss about my seminary time, what, and part of the reason why I ended up, I think, in a religious order is because seminary for me was really a time of prayer. I was very devoted during seminary to delving really deep into Christian spirituality. It was my obsession in seminary. I wanted to learn from the spiritual greats. I wanted to read them. And I wanted to learn to pray as they did. I was enamored with like the Eastern Orthodox monks who could spend hours and hours and hours in contemplative prayer. And I wanted that. And so I would, um, and, I, and I was, uh, would be the right word. Um, I was uh, privileged enough to be in an environment where I could do that. I was in seminary and my whole life was doing that stuff. So I could take hours to kind of carve out time to pray. Um, so I was trying, I think another way of thinking about that, as you said, I like the toys thing, the sister Vinci said. Another way of thinking about it might be prayer languages, right? Like, do you, you know what love languages are? You know, love languages? I think I was trying to find my prayer language. And so like exploring and playing with different kinds of prayer to find out what kind of prayer sort of fit me. All right. That's fascinating. Yeah, I like that you, um, I like your, the, the storytelling you just offered about um, using seminary as a time for prayer and studying about prayer and yeah. learning about all of these different um, love languages, essentially, for God that are available to anyone. And part of that is because I was a new Episcopalian. I mean, I was only Episcopalian for a few years before that. It was all new to me in a certain sense. I only really knew how to pray in one way, which is this sort of way of extemporaneously praying. I was trying to, like, absorb the prayer book tradition so I could be sufficiently Anglican. But then also, like, there was all this other stuff I could learn from. So it was all sort of new to me, and I was trying to figure it out and learn it. And I had good spiritual directors who were trying to invite me to figure out, like, what are, inviting me to say, like, what are new ways you can pray that maybe are different from what you grew up with? And then also, what are things from that background that I could hold on to so that I'm not just throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Yeah. And in some ways, you know, some people would talk about the Ignatian tradition as actually being a bridge point between mm. some of the more, um, oh, let's call it 
strictly organized forms of Catholic monastic prayer and some of the great revival movement. So it, uh, that part of what Ignatius did was create a way that's in between those mm. two worlds. Mm, that's um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I suppose that the Ignatian way of praying has invites you to praying in a much more, what would be the way of putting it, a much more free way. Mm -hmm. And that is different yeah. than the constraints of prayer, especially like the office mm -hmm. or the traditional monastic way of praying. The monastic way of praying is doing the office basically and praying words, especially chanting them, living by a book, in this case, not our prayer book like ours, but a, um, um, what is the word for it? Um, you know, the proper, the yeah, the, yeah, like your, your proper office book. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's different when you're used to that. It is, I mean, it's part of the reason why Ignatius was controversial. Yeah. In his day. Yeah. So, um, so you're here to talk to us about, particularly about this examine method. Yeah. Is this one of, one of these pieces that you've grown some familiarity with? So take it away. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So some background, I'll give some background on who Ignatius was and as where the examine prayer came from. I also, I just want to say that the examine is definitely one of the kinds of prayer that I sort of became most enamored with that I really do. I, I love the exam and I think it's really powerful. I think it has a lot of power for people's daily lives. I think it's like one of the prayer forms that um, I just wish people would consider it more often maybe in their daily use because I think it offers us a lot for like, I'm very concerned with practical Christian living. Like most people wake up on Monday and go to work and then like maybe don't think about church that much Monday through Friday. The examine offers just a richness to help ground our life in God every day. And it is, it is, it is a really deep insight from St. Ignatius. So St. Ignatius is this person who was born in Spain in the 15th century. I have his, yeah, fifth, oh, sorry, six, 1491 was when he was born uh, in Northern Spain. I didn't really know this, but his name is Inigo, Inigo. Um, and Ignatius was him misunderstanding that that was a Latinized version of his name. It wasn't. But it's basically the same as in Princess Bride, right? And you go, and so I was like, oh my gosh, he has the same name as Princess Bride. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, St. Ignatius lived a, before he was St. Ignatius and he was just an ego, he um, lived a pretty worldly life. He was sort of a playboy type. Um, he was a military man uh, and uh, kind of obsessed with like being able to be a socialite, um, his figure, things like that. Famously, um, became very seriously injured, needed to, uh, was not religious, didn't really have a lot of religious intuitions, didn't really care about being religious. Um, he got very seriously injured and needed to have surgery, and the surgery was didn't go well, went very, very badly. And so he needed to have more surgery. And so he was essentially homebound for an extended period of time in his family estate in Spain. And during that time, a family member offered him a book on Jesus and the lives of the saints. And sort of the way the story is told, um, Ignatius uh, didn't have interest in reading it, but there was nothing else to read, essentially. The story is that, oh, there was nothing else for Ignatius to read, and he was stuck at home because of all these surgeries. And he, um, and he found himself reading the uh, lives of the saints and of Jesus, and found himself a regular person who wasn't very religious, saying, you know, I could probably do that. Like reading like St. Francis um, and um, others and saying like, oh, you know, I could probably live like that. I could probably do that, which I think is kind of funny, <laughs> you know, to someone who has no much religious experience reading the life of someone like St. Francis and thinking, oh, I could just, I could do that. He writes about this in his autobiography. Um, and uh, even to this day, if you go to um, the family estate now, uh, you could sit, you, there's like a plaque in the bedroom where he would have his sick bed basically and it says here ignatius of loyola surrendered to god and he essentially gave himself over to god at that place um so ignatius makes a pilgrimage to a Benedict benedictine abbey um and uh basically lays down his military arms his sword his armor in front of the virgin mary but he kind of um he doesn't like lose his military spirit in the sense that like you know he sort of brings that into his 
spiritual life and his approach to missionary work and, and being a religious order, you know, wanting to start a religious order. So he and others, um, Francis Xavier and others, uh, they, they try really hard to convince the Pope to let them start a new religious order. They want to call it the Order of Jesus or the Society of Jesus, They want to, which is the Jesuits now. Uh, but the Pope was very, very skeptical. Uh, they really didn't want them. They, 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 looked, they were very skeptical about the entire thing. The idea of like being a dispersed order, as I was saying before, why I feel like we owe them a debt of gratitude in the orders like mine, it was really, they were skeptical. It, it didn't look like traditional religious life. It wasn't, it didn't have the rigor, the, the same kind of prayer order around the daily office that, um, you know, in a, in a cloister or in a monastery or in the same kind of traditional vows that um, religious had up to that point. And so it was, it was met with skepticism. Um, in fact, he was actually jailed by the Inquisition uh, in 1526. Um, he was in prison for 17 days. Um, so this idea of being a contemplative in action, which is sort of the founding concept of being a Jesuit. You know, is this again being a contemplative in action, being out in the world, sort of doing battle against the spiritual force of the world with prayer as being the main way of doing battle, battling against the sin in your life, doing battle against the evil forces of the world. Um, and uh, so taking your prayer out in that way, almost like a sword or a weapon, is sort of the is sort of the vibe that they that they have. So he kind of brings his military spirit into, uh, into it. Uh, and the examine is, so he writes eventually this thing called the spiritual practices. Um, he, ha he had a number of uh, sort of vision experiences, uh, experiences of being united with God uh, in his prayer life. And eventually that would coalesce into him writing the spiritual exercises, which is his famous book on spirituality and prayer. And um, the core kind of, I don't know if it's fair to say the core, but I, I think I'm not a Jesuit, so it's, I almost hesitate to say this, but it seems to me that like the core prayer practice for Jesuit life, and certainly what was one of the things that was in their rule that he wrote, as in the thing they're required to do, is the examine. And Ignatius required Jesuits to pray the examine twice per day. And to this day, uh, that's what Jesuits do. They pray it at noon, and they pray it at the end of the day. I think when the examine is taught, it's often just sort of taught as an end of day practice, which I really want to try doing it at both lunch and at the end of the day now that I've been thinking about this, because if you're anything like me, remembering your day at the end of the day is very hard. Maybe if you get good at it, you can. But I think that remembering twice a day, remembering your day, reflecting your day at noon and at the end of the day is probably much easier. But the exam is essentially a way of praying Praying reflect like reflecting on your day in prayer. Uh, and so it's it's sort of the core practice that Ignatius wrote about and taught to um, you know Jesuits and required of them. And so this is what the exam is. There's really five points in the exam. Um, it's a five-step prayer process. The first step is becoming aware of God's presence. It's sort of just a uh, contemplative stance. It's sort of take, deciding you're going to take this time to enter into a time of prayer, entering into quiet, maybe into um, a deep breathing in order to try to bring your awareness to God's presence with you for prayer. And then it's reviewing the day with gratitude. I'll say more about that in a second. Paying attention to your emotions, choosing one feature from your day and praying from it, and looking forward to tomorrow. In his writing, St. Ignatius really believed that ingratitude was the most, is the worst sin. Ingratitude, and that thankfulness was one of our core weapons for living, fighting against sort of um, sin in our lives and uh, living a spiritual life was thankfulness. He saw thankfulness as being just key to everything in the Christian life. Uh, and so part of the idea of reviewing your day in prayer is to not search for sin in it, things that you've done wrong that you need to you know, pray for, you can confess and ask for forgiveness for, but looking at your entire day with gratitude. And, and Ignatius wrote about how um, most especially when we find it hard to be thankful, 
is when it's most important for us to try to approach our day and see things through the lens of gratitude. So the core part, the central part of the exam then is this review of your day. It's looking back um, at the steps of your day and doing so as a prayer, which is sort of a checklist, but as a prayer through the lens of gratitude. And then the next thing, which I think is a really deep spiritual insight is the pay attention to your emotions step. Because I think, you know, we are, modern psychology has offered us a lot of these insights, but I think that Ignatius had a lot of them before modern psychology and other spiritual leaders like Ignatius. Um, it's really hard to be fully aware of our motives and our true emotions. So to pay attention as we review our day to our emotions can help us to understand our motives and have deeper insights into ourselves as we think about the course of our day. For, for Jesuits and for modern Roman Catholics who pray the examine, part of this is in order to understand perhaps the nature of your own sins so that you might confess it more clearly. Some people may struggle to know what it is that they need to confess. And so doing this exam, and while the purpose isn't to sort of find your sin throughout the day, reviewing your emotions can help you understand your own intentions and motives in a way that kind of just, I don't know, brush away some of the cloudiness about why things happen in your day, why you did things in your day, and to kind of understand yourself better, have a little clear, better clarity of understanding what the content of your own day and your own choices and your own words. And then in doing that, maybe find, oh, well, you know, I really was acting selfishly when I said this thing to this person, although I thought at the time I was, I really wanted everyone to think I was sort of being um, altruistic, but really I was doing this for some selfish motivation. And, um, maybe in figuring that out, you might confess it. So, you know, paying attention to your emotions helps gain clarity as you're reviewing your day. Um, and then after doing this day review, you take one feature, just one thing out of the whole day, you pick one thing. And then you pray to God from it. That could be with words, or it could be sort of just contemplative, wordlessly sort of entering into a time of being attentive to God's presence with that thing from that one thing from your day. And then the very important the last step is looking toward tomorrow. Um, I was, you know, there is a, uh, there's an al alcoholics and there's an AA thing, um, the one day at a time concept, you know, the idea that you only have one day at a time. I think it's a really interesting insight. Um, looking forward tomorrow was about just remembering that with this day is done. Now there is one more, you know, there is tomorrow. Um, we take the spiritual life one day at a time. And, you know, you can't change your whole life necessarily all at once, but you can take it one day at a time and you can look toward tomorrow with intentionality having reviewed the day that was passed. So that's the exam, it's these five steps. Becoming aware of God's presence, reviewing the day with gratitude, paying attention to your emotions, choosing a feature from the day and praying from it and looking toward tomorrow. And there are actually like a zillion variations on the exam. There are variations of the exam that people have written about that are like a social justice exam, like praying the day about justice and, and privilege and things like that. There's all, all kinds of variations that you can find if you look it up. But that's that's the exam. Yeah. Do we wanna do we have do we wanna do some we absolutely exam? have time. I was thinking though yeah. that yeah. um just to connect to yeah. some of what you were saying of yeah. the um that place where our emotions are the most prominent to us at the end of the day. Mm. 
is it was such a valuable insight and you named it modern psychology has said yeah we really need to pay attention to this and even modern like theological reflection methods and so on are like pay mm -hmm. attention to those moments of greatest energy greatest emotion mm -hmm. whether it's positive or negative like if you were really yeah. angry there's something present if you really had almost no, even having almost no emotion is having an emotion about something, mm -hmm. um, particularly if it's a, a strong sort of pit type moment. Um, and that following those sort of like touchstones through the day and letting that be an invitation into the conversation about what God is trying to invite us into mm -hmm. noticing about our world ourselves god's intention for us um it continues to amaze me just in the powerfulness yeah. of that yeah the, the 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 sort of great teachers of monasticism over christian history for two thousand years have have sort of been interested in where our emotional energy is you know, I don't know that if Ignatius read, say, Evagrius Ponticus or not, who was a desert, um, like a sixth century or I forget, yeah, something like sixth century or fifth century, um, desert, uh, desert dweller, desert dwelling monastic. Um, I don't know if you read Evagrius or not, but Evagrius sort of thought that if you can figure out where your emotions are, you could see where spiritual forces were trying to attack you, you know, and he offered a whole bunch of other really interesting insights that would later be sort of um, affirmed by modern psychology. And so then after, from Evagrius onward, there is a lot of interest in where do we have this emotional content? And I think, so Ignatius is pretty brilliant in taking this practice of reviewing the day, which seems kind of simple on the one hand, but, but elegant and brilliant, which is, and to look for where are those moments of, um, like you said, either emotional energy or lack of energy, sort of like, um, you know, like why? And then you can ask that question, like why? Why is there emotional energy there? Is God trying to speak through that? Like what is, what is the reason? I don't know. It could be, it could be a whole bunch of reasons why there's that emotional energy there. Um, but to do that in a prayerful way is to reframe the way we see the world, right? So that we see... So we see that emotional energy in the light of God's gracious guidance to our day. I mean, I think that's where the gratitude piece comes in. That at no point, I said, no point, I think in the exam, do you stop the gratitude? So even in looking for our emotional content in the day so that we can help better understand our motives and our, you know, our struggles, um, we still even do that step through the lens of gratitude and seeing it as, God's gracious guidance and action on our day. So, so why are we having this emotion? Maybe even I had I have a I have a confessor um, in my religious order who I make confession to, and he sometimes says to me that our emotions are gifts from angels. So I find it to be a really interesting way of thinking about it. But I think the idea is that when we can, if we see our our emotions, not that I think that we should see them as coming from outside of us. But if we see them as gifts to us to notice, that's what I think the prayer practice invites us to do. Yeah, yeah. One of the alternative forms that I frequently, actually it's probably where I start from, is one that uses the first step as, as relish. Mm. And I don't like relish, so I tend to think of it as savor. Uh, um, because yeah. the intention is this, um, appreciation and if you imagine it like when they tell you instead of just um putting food in your mouth and just swallowing it straight you should savor the flavors and really get the taste and um all of what's present there as a as a gratitude actually practice um so i, I yeah I, I echo your sense of the importance of gratitude in the self-examination i'm wondering if any of our other friends have any specific questions before we go into um, being led through praying and examine. Now I'm just seeing ideas. And as I even mentioned yesterday, the pieces of the puzzle, I'm trying to put them all together and just getting all these ideas too. There's even more pieces, but 
I can see a way when they, when things can fit together in a, you know a time or two a day. So I, I appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting how the pieces go together because it was actually our session with Mackenzie that some of my exam and practice maybe just wasn't grabbing my attention the way it had been. And our session with Mackenzie, which was on body prayer, mm -hmm. gave me the idea to mix the two up. Yeah. And there's actually like established like yoga forms of the exam. And sure. I, I noticed those. I haven't tried them yet. Right now I'm just going cool. freestyle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, um, it's been such a gift yeah. to mix those two. Um, I'm really glad there's no cameras in the room where I do it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really neat. I think that Ignatius would probably love the idea of involving your body in prayer. I think it's probably something that he, you know wasn't wouldn't have been thought of in his time really. But right. but he would love that. You know, especially with his military. I mean, if he could was here today, he'd probably be the first person doing that. Yeah. Uh, especially with his military background and everything. Um, but yeah, inviting your body into it. There are so many different ways to pray the exam and that people will look at. Just Google search it so yeah. you can find There's even an app uh, that's got a number of different forms. Mm -hmm. um, a, a fairly famous Jesuit, James Martin, has a daily podcast that will walk you through it so you could just listen to it. And so it frees you from having to think about it at all and just be present in the relationship. So why don't we go ahead and get started with giving it a try? Sure. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever led the exam, so I'm looking forward to doing this. We'll do a very short version of it. So, um, all right. Well, I'll invite us all to close our eyes then. And the first step of the exam is to um, become aware of God's presence. So I just sort of invite you to take some deep breaths. And as we were just talking about using our body to pray, I think even not moving we can sit into our bodies and be embodied in our deep breathing and in our aware of God, awareness of God's presence here with us as our whole selves. We ask God to join us in this time of prayer and ask God to help us become aware of the ways in which God was already present here with us. God's closeness to us and everything that we do through the day. God's incredible, incredible closeness to us in this moment. We ask God to help us to review our day with a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude. Uh, and invite, I invite us to begin reviewing the day that is past, uh, beginning at the start of our day and reviewing through all the things that have passed this day that we can recall, stopping at every moment that seems to stand out being thankful for every opportunity, every face that we've seen, the conversation we've had, the things we've heard, the senses that we remember throughout the day. The way God was speaking to us in our day and in everything that we did today.
as you review your day, I invite you to pay attention to your emotions. Think about how you felt through the day. Think about how you felt in the early parts of your day, the first things of your day. Think about how you felt the moments when you were alone, times when you were with other people, significant conversations that you had. Notice where you may have had stronger feelings that you can easily recall. Give thanks to God for those feelings and wonder at them and what they might tell you about that moment in your day. And what God might have been speaking to you through it. Remember how you felt in the latter parts of the day. And pay attention to your feelings now in this place. Emotions that are maybe on the surface and maybe feelings that are underneath the surface that you only can barely notice are there. Now I invite you to take one feature of your day from today, something that speaks to you from the day that has passed so far, and to pray from it, to lift that thing to God in words or in contemplative silence, inviting God into conversation with you about that feature from the day. Now I invite us to turn to tomorrow, to look to tomorrow with thanks and hope, turn our attention to what God might be inviting us to tomorrow. 
We may even wish to set our intention for tomorrow now. What are we thankful for as we enter into tomorrow, as we approach a new day that God will bring? Where do we see God inviting us tomorrow? What gifts do we carry from today as we enter into a new day? the things that are hard and challenging for us to be thankful for that we carry into tomorrow. Creator God, I thank you for this day that has passed. I ask that you guide us safely through the night and bring us with hope and expectation for whatever day you will bring tomorrow, that we might see your gracious guidance in our day, hear you speak to us, see you, especially in the faces of the stranger and those in need, those different from us. Hear you speak to us in the voices of others and in the silence. God, I ask that you, that you help us to be grateful and thankful for that gracious guidance in our journey tomorrow. Thank you for making each day new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And that is a very short version of doing the exam. But what I like, a couple of things just what I wanted to say about that. One. We can do the exam in very short if you want to, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, if, and if you're not accustomed to doing long periods of silence and prayer, doing the exam for five minutes might seem like an eternity. Doing any contemplative silent prayer for five minutes might seem like an, etern an eternity. But if you are accustomed to prayer, it might, you might want to do it for a half an hour. You might find that it's really impossible to review your day in five minutes. <laughs> Depends on who you are. Um, but also, I just, you know, I think one of the things that stands out to me about it is that it is about our daily life. And I think it's such a great way to pray for people who are just sort of living their daily life and trying to live this, this crazy journey of like, I'm trying to follow this person, Jesus, and what he taught and trying to live the way of love and trying to practice my faith every day, which can be really hard. And the exam helps us to recenter our day every day at lunch or at the end of our day and invite God into it. So this is just my sort of thoughts on doing that. Thank you. I appreciate you leading us through a brief form of the exam. Um, because it's you know really between you and God, I'm going to let it stay in that space and I'm not going to ask anyone any questions about that experience, I hope it gave you some gifts and tools, a, a new toy for your to toy box for that relationship with God and neighbor and not letting prayer um, get stuck in that place of just, well, I'm just reading the words and that if you say the magic spell in front of the book, the magic will happen. Um, so, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for having me to talk about it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this off next week. Um, I said I'm going to turn it off and then I kept talking. I do that a lot, don't I? Um, so next week is my friend Lanny Collins. Lanny uh, used to be a professor of organ. Um, and I knew him from my time in Washington. And he's also a deeply spiritual man. So he's going to be talking to us about the spirituality of music oh, and singing. So, cool. so um, I'm looking forward to that. I wish I could have Lanny right here in the room with me. Yeah. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. So I hope people will tune in for that either in person and he'll be joining us from, they're currently in Idaho waiting for their house wow. to get built in Oregon. So um, anyway, so he'll be joining us long distance. So 
All right. Well, thank you, Ben. I'm going to stop you. this. Judy, thank you thank for you, joining ben. us. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I will see you around, Judy. Today went really, really well. Oh, good. I'm glad. I thought so too. It's great. Okay. okay. Thank you.